is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Christy Wright, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, is my co-host today as we take your questions about your life and your money. The Ramsey Show is a different kind of talk radio. This is all about you. It's service-oriented talk radio. We're here to serve you. We take care of you. We answer your questions. Sometimes we bonk you on the head for your own good because we love you, but uh, it's all about you. The phone number is 888 825 Christy's new book, Take Back Your Time, The Guilt-Free Guide to Life Balance, will be out in just a couple of weeks. It is still on pre-sale, which is good news for you folks. Uh, on pre-sale, you can get about $100 worth of extras added in. We bribe you to buy the book early uh, <laughs> because it helps us with the bestseller lists and it helps us with the pre-sale numbers the whole bit so you jump in and uh, it'll help christy out you will in love this book if you're interested in the subject of balance um and the illusion of balance and so forth. Christy will break all of that down for you in this wonderful new book. So be sure and check it out. Let's start off this hour with uh, Rochelle in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Hi, Rochelle. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Um, I have quit a job after 30 years, and I have a 401k plan in it. Mm -hmm. and I do not know what to do with that money. I have to take it out, and I'm not uh, in retiring age or anything like that, and mm -hmm. I need to know what to do with it. Okay, good. How much you got in there? 85000 Oh, this is pretty important then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay, so there's a, a couple of rules that I want everyone to learn about investing. Number one, you do not put money in things you do not understand. Just because I understand them or Christy understands them, that doesn't make it okay. You've got to understand it. And um, so once you do, and it's not that difficult, uh, it's not, you know, not, not, not like you have to go get a degree in brain surgery or something. Okay, you'll be all right. But um, keep it simple. Uh, and, and so the second rule is, is that in order to understand it, the type of financial person you need in your life needs to have the heart of a teacher. Yeah. And one okay. of the things that I think is important, Rochelle, is as you have someone walk through this with you, they will break it down. They will have the heart of a teacher. So they'll explain things step by step. You can ask lots of questions and they'll show you what to do next. I'm not an expert on investing. I have an investment professional that I sit down with. So when I left my job before I started working here at Ramsey Solutions 12 years ago, I sat down with an investment professional to talk about retirement, where it needs to go and that type of thing. And that's what they're there for. And we have endorsed local providers that help you do that, that show you exactly what to do next. Yeah, our Smart Vester pros, you just click on Smart Vester at Ramsey Solutions and you'll find someone in your area with the heart of a teacher. Now, here's what they're going to tell you to do, and let's walk through it a little bit, okay? Number one, what I okay. want you to do, it's called, an, it's called a rollover. You're going to do a direct transfer rollover into an IRA. There'll be no taxes okay. if you do it the correct way, okay? okay? Now, the incorrect way would be tell your HR department to send you the check. Uh-uh. They have to withhold 20%, so they're going to keep about 20000 of the eighty-five back for taxes because they think you're withdrawing it, and you're not withdrawing it. And the government makes okay. them hold 20% back. So you're going to get a check for like 65000 but you have to put 85000 into an IRA to avoid taxes and penalties. So now you're up a creek because you're twenty grand short. So you do not want them to cut the check to you. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So the direct transfer rollover works like this. You sit down, you contact one of those smart investor pros, you sit down with them, you select the mutual funds that you want to put the money into, 
And we always suggest four mm-hmm. types, growth, growth and income, aggressive growth, and international. You'll learn about those, and you'll hear those again when you sit down with a Smart Investor Pro. They don't work for us, but they do stuff the way we teach. And one of those things okay. is they're going to do it with a teacher with you, at the heart of a teacher. Now, when you sit down with them, you're going to pick out, say, four mutual funds, and you're going to fill out the paperwork that says – direct transfer on it and that paperwork is going to be sent to your hr department they're going to then send the money directly into those mutual funds there is nothing withheld on the money so the whole eighty-five thousand will go over there where you tell it to go and there'll be zero taxes on it now you've got an investment pro in your corner to teach you and talk to you and answer questions at any time you are in control of the money where it's invested you can change it later if you want to everything is uh, you know, ready to go, and it's completely in your control. And again, it's fairly simple, but you just have to fill out the right paperwork, and you got to have somebody help you lay it all out. Does that all make sense in general? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. So where were you working? What kind of job did you have? Tyson's. Okay. All right. Why are you gone yeah, after 30 years? Uh, it did not work out to where I was transferred to at another plant because I moved, oh. and it just it just not did not work out in that plant for okay. me. All right, wow, that's a long time to be a one with one company. And now, what are you going to do now? Uh, I don't know. I'm looking for a job. I, I'm not sure. Okay, how old are you? 58. Okay, great. Well, you got lots of time to start fresh. We call these uh, encore careers. You ever go to a, 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 a music show and uh, when they finish, they leave, but then they come back out, take a bow, and go again? That's what you're going to yeah. do. You're going to come back out, take a bow, and go again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So if you want some information on career and that kind of thing, check out our website, kencoleman.com. It's all free. And Ken is our resident expert on, well, that taking the bow, going again. That's right. Trying to find something new, getting clear on what this next stage and season is for you. Dave, I have a question, even as you're talking about this rollover. When someone is leaving an old job or has left an old job, how urgent from a timeline perspective is it that they roll this over? Because I know people that just leave some of these retirement accounts with that old job. And we've even had calls here on the show. They're like, I had this job you know, 20 years ago, I don't even know where it is and yeah. I can't find it. How, how urgent is it that someone do that? Well, there's no regulation preventing you from right. doing it any time. But from your advice, so I, mean. I would just go ahead and, you know, it's part of the transition that you go through. I mean, you're filling out all kinds of paperwork when you leave a job, right. you know, and it's just make that be, you got to go get your new insurance. You got to go figure out what you're doing next. You got all this. And so I would just go ahead and make it part of that. And, and cause you might forget about it. Right. Or not be able to find it after a while. Like yeah, we've had those calls. For, yeah. We've, people forget what was going on. I don't even how much was in there i just left and 20 years later i'm trying to figure it out now (laughs) see that's another reason you take it with you right you've got more options in the open market to pick from yep you've got more control and you got someone that's got your back an investment pro in your corner when you do a direct transfer rollover so we always tell you always take it from your old job not to your new job but to an individual rollover every time you leave this is the ramsey show What makes our show unique is that we genuinely care about our listeners. We're intentional about choosing the best advertisers to recommend. Blinds.com is no exception. They offer high quality window treatments at unbelievable prices, and they make it simple to shop blinds, shades, and interior shutters with easy online ordering, free shipping, and a guaranteed perfect fit. Go to blinds.com and take advantage of this week's special savings. So the year 
2021 is the year of Christy Wright books. <laughs> Every time I look up, there's another thing that we have coming out, Christy Wright. So we had a devotional a little bit earlier that became a number one bestseller. We've got a, a book coming out in just a couple of weeks in September, Take Back Your Time, The Guilt-Free Guide to Life Balance, a major book project. And then uh, every year for the last uh, six or seven years, yeah. I guess, we yeah. have done a goal planner. And the 2022 Christy Wright Goal Planner goes on sale today. Yes, and this is this is important for people to know because, and I'm sure you remember this last year, Dave, you got calls about it like I did, but we sold out early. It always does. And mm -hmm. so if you want your copy, get it now, even though 2022 is a little bit away. Go ahead and get your copy, and then you'll have it before we sell out. And uh, and one of the things, you and I have talked about this with Dave, but um, about this with the planner, but it's not just a calendar. It has content, tools, templates that are going to help you stick with your goals, and I think oh, that makes it more valuable. Full life manual going yeah. on here. <laughs> I like I that mean, life it's, manual. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a beast. It's a big old thing. I mean, it's it's there's a lot. I mean, just the shipping cost. This thing's a, it's a it's a chunky monkey man. There's a lot. But I mean, yeah, you've got scripture in here. You've got stuff to do every day. Things I'm doing this week. It is so well laid out, so well done, and uh, our sales double almost every year. Yeah. Um, because the people, everybody buys it. They bought it last year, plus all the new people, and so the it, it is a um, it's a, a very successful product. Yeah. But uh, just, you know, here's the thing. Okay, we don't run out of books. When we print books, we're not going to run out of books. Okay. We're always going to have a book available for you. Calendars, however, have a shelf life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in other words, this is not going to be much good by this time next year. And the likelihood of us being able to sell it this time next year is about zero. And so from a business perspective, our goal is to have exactly the number that you people want. And we'll, we don't have to throw any in the dumpster <laughs> and everybody gets one. Now, you know what the likelihood of all that working out? Zero. Okay. <laughs> so in lieu of that, I'm not throwing them in the dumpster. That means I'm not over ordering and I own this freaking place. So if you want one, they always run out. We plan for them to run out we plan for the planner <laughs> to run out so just, just, just to let you guys in on inside baseball here this right. is how it works all right our goal is to run out at the right time yeah, and we don't want to run out too soon but just soon enough that some of you that put it off you get punished a little bit a, <laughs> last year last year though i do think we set a record in terms of we sold out earlier than we ever had we sold out we, we actually snuck a speed reorder we did and still sold out of that even earlier yeah. people were i mean people would message me even in march can i get a plan i'm like no, no it's no, March. it's gone <laughs> but now's your now's your time we're telling you early get your copy while we've got them and, and uh, it's a great beautiful. tool now you kept with the same theme with the painting yeah it's, it's really pretty but this it's also it's amazing how we talk about this day but personal development you're looking at all the different spokes in the wheel of life you're looking at all the different aspects of your life so every month we're focusing on a different aspect of your life to help you grow in that area so it's it's goals it's personal development it's it's managing your calendar it's all those things so if you want to make 2022 different by focusing on things that matter most to you, uh, the new 2022 Gold Planner on sale right now. You need to hurry, get your copy. They sell out every year. We talked about that at length. Uh, so prepare. Go to RamseySolutions.com. They're not up on Amazon yet. We'll get them up there in a couple days. But just order it from RamseySolutions.com from the web, from our store, and we'll get them out to you. And they're in stock, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get it. Of course, doesn't do, you don't need it, right? You don't have to have it until 2020. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have December in it, does it? No. Like 21. No. Okay, so it doesn't, it's no good till January 1. That's right. But, uh, but, but get it early hey, because it'll be gone. Yeah, that way you don't have to think about it again. You don't have to kick yourself later for forgetting to order it. So uh, RamseySolutions.com. Get them while the getting's good. Uh, yet another Christy Wright product <laughs> out this year. Um, I've been busy, Dave. <laughs> well, we can't, you know, if you're awake, you're writing. So <laughs> That's a fact. It's just the way it works. We know about you. You're going to be writing. I'm going to be talking, and you're going to be writing. This is the way it works. Open phones here at 888-825-5225. Karen is in Tampa, Florida. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Um, so, Dave, um, I am a recent widow. Um, I have two uh, adulting college-age children, one who is 21. The other one is um, 23. 
uh, recently graduated and is starting the process to be financially independent. Um, yes. Um, so in the process of gathering everything together after my husband's um, death, one of the things I did was I did start to um, consolidate all our 401ks and investments. Um, I froze all of his credit and credit card accounts. Um, and I followed one of your videos um, that said, don't do much the very first two months. Um, so I'm kind of at that point where I need to start taking some action. So it's been um, two months? And the first, um, not quite, not mm-hmm. quite. It's been about six, uh, about six to seven weeks now. I'm so sorry. Um, what happened? So I Thank you. Um, well, he is, he was a stage four colon cancer patient. He um, mm. unfortunately uh, was diagnosed um, very, very late and uh, fought a good fight, mm. um, but unfortunately lost. Yeah. So, so y'all um, were married, what, 25 years? Um, no, um, that was very sweet of you. <laughs> we, we had a 23-year-old, I was guessing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, we actually were married a, a little over 32 years. Okay. Um, wow. So, um, yeah, yeah. So How are you doing? It's a new, um, hanging in there. Um, some days? Work has been awesome. Uh, work, yeah, some days have been others. Um, work has been great. Um, couldn't have done it without my work family mm. and my church family. Mm. Um, yeah. But my 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 question is, um, we are um, at one of our goals that um, my husband and I spoke about was helping our kids um, into those adulting behaviors. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I started to look at everything, um, I'm very very well set off in our retirement funding um and um i am going to pay off um our mortgage mm-hmm. um my husband was um very very good at life insurance so i do have um some funds available to me and the first thing i want to do in the spirit of dave ramsey is to pay off my mortgage mm-hmm. um which was also his intent as well. So I'm mm-hmm. very committed to that. Okay. Um, but I've noticed um, that I have, with my children being the age that they're in, um, we did not do a very good job with um, thinking about titling of cars and insurance. And now that I have this sum of money, I really want to protect it. Um, it's something that my husband did, and I know that he would want it to be something that not only serves me, but also serves my family and um, my faith. So, <laughs> so I'm calling to get an idea of how do I do that? Do I title the cars in my kids' names? The kids' cars and, should be in their name and they should pay their own insurance or you give them the money to pay the insurance. Okay, that was that was one of my questions. Yeah, and because if that, he wrecks and it's in yeah. your name, they might come after you. Gotcha. Simple, okay. simple as that. And so it might cost a little bit more on insurance for it to be in their name. But when mine turned 18, I moved them into their name immediately as a, as a risk okay. management thing. It had nothing to do with I don't like Correct. the kid. It, it did cost me a little <laughs> bit more in, in insurance. So, yes, we did do I, I that. Did. And, then, and then just, again, with the investments, with the large sums, just take your time. Take your time. If it takes you a year to wade into those investments um, and get everything set up, that's fine. You're a very task-oriented person. Um, One of the ways you feel better is if you get stuff done. I can hear it the way she's talking, right? Yep, Yep, exactly. And that's not a bad thing, um, but, uh, you know, be very careful. Go very gentle and slow. Give yourself room. Give yourself room, and you're going to be fine. And you call us anytime we can help, hon.
Christy Wright, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. One thing we are sure about personal finance is that it is 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. So anything in your life that affects your behavior positively or negatively is actually more important than the technical financial teaching the technical finance understanding the details of an investment important controlling the person in your mirror absolutely vital and so when you have things happen to you um you need to give yourself a little bit of a somehow we feel like we have to be like financial superman financial superwoman even when we're really going through a hard time. Yeah. Like our last caller who just lost her husband. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, you don't have to be superwoman. Well, I think it's that. I think also sometimes, like you said, it might even be, um, it can be a coping strategy where we're like, I just want to do stuff. I want to control what I can control. But to your point, there's not a timeline you have to do all this on. And so one of the most powerful things you can do, and this is with money decisions, but any decision is just consider the season that you're in. And I don't think we do that enough, Dave, whether it's with your, your health, your family, your work, your business, even your money. When you consider the season that you're in, then you can set goals and make plans that are a reflection of what's going on in that season. So yeah. the season of mourning after losing your husband might not be the time to knock at all your, all your checklist on your, uh, you know, going through all the paperwork stuff. It might be something you do more gradually over six to nine months than in those first um, few months. And so I think there's just there's something really powerful of stopping, checking in with yourself, considering the season that you're in before you put all the pressure on yourself. Because sometimes we put pressure on ourselves, and it's not the right time, the right season for that pressure or that goal. Well, and I think the reason we do is we, we've lost this, we've got this disconnect as if finance sits over here in its own little column of our life, its own little silo of our life, and everything else is over on the other side. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but, and so no matter what's going over in, in our, the big swath of our life, somehow we're supposed to be okay with the money part. Yeah. Or we're supposed to, um, you know, uh, not do, uh, you know, not be susceptible to stress spending or, or grief spending or not be, of course you are. Right. And people do some of the dumbest things when their personal life is messed up yeah. with money yeah, or when their personal life is going like really, really good yeah, and they feel invincible. Like I got the Midas touch. Everything I touch turns to gold. And no, you don't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, you don't. I mean, you know, you get you get this high because everything seems to be working and then you go do something that's super high risky. Yeah. But in your mind, Makes because everything's sense. been going good, <laughs> it's not it, it doesn't feel super high risky. Yeah. So, of course, it's super high risky. Well, and I think that the bottom line, too, is in any of these extremes, whether you're an extreme of of grief or healing or even just, you know, you've got a lot going on, you're busy, maybe you're just super tired. It's hard to think clearly in those times. It's hard to think clearly when you're mourning. It's hard to think clearly when you're exhausted and just trying to keep your head above water. And so I think that when you can get into a space where you can think clearly, then you're going to make better decisions. But if you're just reacting, you're just flying by the seat of your pants or or trying to just um, control things to control them, you're not necessarily going to make the best decisions. You need to think clearly and get out of that in order to make better decisions. So uh, Deloney talked about this, and John, Dr. John Deloney, when we were going through COVID this time last year, and people were in freak-out mode, mm-hmm. that when, you're, when your brain is in freak-out mode, whether it's anger, fear, pain, grief, whatever, you're just overwhelmed with emotion, it shuts down your critical thinking skills. Yeah. Because you go into fight or flight. Yes, and uh, he talked about that, and, and you know, we kind of all know that from a common sense, but hearing it from a PhD made, yes. it, made it sound smarter, but um, yeah. I'm not sure he no. is. But anyway, no, he, he makes, sure, has a lot of, <laughs> sure has a lot of letters after his name. But um, It makes sense, though. But yeah, so, so hint, all of us have periods of time in our life, short and long, that there is extreme emotion. Mm-hmm. Do not make big financial decisions during a moment of extreme emotion. Yeah. The logic part of your brain is literally not working. A hundred percent of your decisions suck <laughs> during that time because you are not, I mean, you know, i can give you an example. When people get scared, they get super scared. They get desperate. Right after you get desperate is when you fall for get rich quick mm. and you get conned. 
because you're like, I'm 58. I just woke up and realized I've got no money. I got to retire. And they all of a sudden, they go into orbit, right? Yeah. And, and what they do, they go some of the dumb butt, get rich quick investing stuff, and they get ripped off. Mm-hmm. And so they destroy what little opportunity they had to actually catch up, yeah. which you can do at 58. You're not going to die. You're going to make it. Little baby, but <laughs> um, but, but you know that, that when you when I get desperate, yes. right after I get desperate, I get really stupid. Well, yes, desperate decisions are always bad ones. We talk about this even through entree leadership with hiring. When you're desperate, you're going to make a bad hire because oh, you're just desperate. You're always. not thinking clearly. It's 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 true with anything though. We Ken Coleman and I have talked about this when we've hosted the show on Fridays together. We have people calling in and they took a job that was the wrong job because they were desperate, and I was like, man, that was a bad decision. Yeah. What do you do then? So. Desperate. That's a, that's such a good point. Desperate decisions are are always bad decisions. I had a friend that married a woman that he shouldn't have married oh, because he was desperate. That's that's <laughs> that's next level. That's next level. <laughs> it cost you a lot of money though. I'm just saying. <laughs> and headaches and stress and, and lots of it things. goes bad. Yeah. And the same thing could be true of some lady that hired or married a bad dude. I mean, it's, it goes yep. both ways. Yep. It's an expensive mistake. Yeah. Serious. So all kidding aside, with all the stuff happening with COVID, mm-hmm. with grief around any kind of a situation, you, you get fired. Mm-hmm. Well, what happens? You go through the stages of grief. Yeah. You get mad. You're in denial. You blame other people. It's probably your fault, but you don't come to that immediately. Uh, might not be your fault. I don't know. I got fired one time, and the guy, I, I never knew why I got you fired. You still don't know why. No, and he died, so I'll never <laughs> You'll know. never find out. And he cussed me out when he fired me, so I really, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, I should be nice about it, but he's dead. And so, but yeah, I, so I, one of the things I vowed around here over all these years is if we're going to let someone leave, they're going to at least know why, and they're going to, if if at all possible, had a lot of warnings. Yes, yeah, a lot of heads it, so. up about it. But if you get fired, you get caught off guard. That lady in our earlier segment been with Tyson thirty years. Yeah, didn't work out. Yeah. In oh, you heard? Oh, yeah. You, you can hear it. the pain. Yes. There's a story there. At the new plant. There's a story there. Yeah. And if, if while that stuff is in your stomach and coming up into the back of your throat, not a good time to buy a house. Yeah. 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 <laughs> not a good time to, you know, suddenly say I'm going to open a business and go four hundred thousand dollars in debt. Yeah. yeah, to medicate the fact that I'm really hurting, pissed off, and wondering about my own worth Value. in the world yep. and personal finance. So the more stable, steady, consistent, predictable the person, yeah. the higher probability they build wealth. You know what? I'm curious your thoughts on this. When you said that you made this reference to starting a business, uh, Ken Coleman and I, when we were hosting the show a couple of weeks ago, we got the blinds.com question. It was this woman who had had a salon for 22 years, closed it due to COVID, and then was not sure what to do now. And in her, you know, when they submit these questions, we don't can ask follow up, but she, open, reopening the salon wasn't an option. And it led me to wonder, I wonder how many businesses closed in COVID because of, you know, whatever the, the expenses and all that, but then didn't reopen, not because the business wasn't viable again, but because they were so hurt. They're broken. They heart. felt so like they failed, like yeah. they were, cause I'm going, she, when she I went could broke, restart. Yeah, when I she went broke and I closed it. Ramsey investments uh-huh. and I had this cool sign and I had to take it off the wall. Mm-hmm. It did something. It was, it was not just closing a business. When no. I turned the key. That's right in that door the last time Mm -hmm. and walked away from that building it was like the death of a dream Mm -hmm. and uh, it was a very real thing did i need to be making major life decisions of any kind money included during that time no right so you know you just gotta at any point of high emotion positive or negative take a chill pill wait a beat or three before you make major financial decisions this is the ramsey show
Christy Wright, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. John is with us in Tampa, Florida. Hey, John, how are you? I'm doing well, Dave. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So through a few life events, um, I was able to pay my house off sooner than what I expected, which left me with a, I guess, a surplus in my emergency fund. With that being said, should I adjust my emergency fund and invest? Oh, I say adjust it. Should I yeah, adjust it down? Because now, obviously, I don't need as much because I don't have any bills. Everything's paid for and invest the remainder of that. Well, yeah, yeah you're, it should be three to six months of expenses. And what you're saying is you're with the house paid off, you got hardly any expenses, right? I have, I literally have zero expenses. No, I mean, you have I food and lights and water and insurance and you electrical yes. yeah, and all just, that. Yeah. Yeah, just the basics. Um, and then on the flip side, I also, I drive a 20-year-old car. And so I've also considered maybe purchasing a new car one day, obviously not yeah. in this market, but in the near future. Yeah, get you, um, get you a better car, which also, by the way, will lower your need for an emergency fund. Yes. Because yes. the transmission going out in that hoopty is more likely than in a decent car, right? Correct, yes. Yeah. John, so. have you run the numbers yet of what, um, you know, your old emergency fund was based on and what the new one is based on with these new, you know, lower expenses so you know about what the surplus is? Um, just no, haven't sat down and ran the numbers, but I figured currently I have about 55000 in an emergency fund. My wife and I do one thirty. So we were figuring probably twenty five thousand would be yeah substantial. Okay, yeah, that'd be fine. And then you, I'd earmark some of the rest of that for the car, and then invest the rest of it, or maybe have a have some fun with the rest of it. Whatever you've done, great. You're baby step seven, man. You're rocking it. Yeah. Are you okay. a baby step okay. millionaire yet? Uh yes, I am. Way to go! Way to go! That's Congratulations. awesome. Congratulations! Well done. How old are you? I am fifty one. My wife, my wife is fifty two. I'm fifty one. Good for you. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. I, so I, here's the thing. The uh, As we have built wealth, Sharon and I have noticed we have less emergencies because we own nicer things. <laughs> you know, it's like the cars I used to drive were an emergency looking for a freaking place to happen, okay? <laughs> you, They were an emergency. They, they yeah. were, and I was driving my emergency, you know? <laughs> and, and then once you get decent vehicles and you've got a little margin, you literally have fewer emergencies. And so I don't even, I mean... The, the chances of us actually not cash flowing 90 something percent of our emergencies just out of checking is pretty low uh, these days. And so, uh, you know, it, because, again, it, when you're broke, everything, your life looks like a country song. Everything is an emergency, you know. And so it does change over time. And it, the it's kind of. Like oxymoronic, you know, they always say, well, you know, the banker will loan you money only when you don't need it, you know, <laughs> and it's like, well, you only, you, you know, by the time you don't need an emergency fund, right? you know, yeah. it, it's like, it you does, it, does. It, it seems like that you should not need the emergency fund in the early days. It'd be helpful, right. you know, but no, you got to have it when you're starting baby steps one through. But when you're at seven and you're hitting millionaire status, you're making 130. Yeah. Yeah. 25 is going to be plenty. Dude. And, and Cause John, you got other money. And John, get that car. I hear yes. it in your voice. You're a saver. I love that about you. That's what's gotten you to this point. Enjoy some of that money. It is sitting there and your car's old. Yeah. Well, he Fix. doesn't want to buy it because they're crazy right now is all. I know, but, but yeah. I know, but that emergency that's waiting to happen, it's going to come out of that or it's going to come out of your emergency <laughs> well, fund, whichever way you want to look at it. Make sure you get it for Christmas anyway. By the by the time Christmas I like gets that. here. I like that. Go ahead, Good go goal. ahead and start planning your Christmas gift. Good goal. <laughs> Amber's in Minneapolis. Hey, Amber, what's up? Hi, Dave. Hi, Christy. Hope Hi. your day's going well. Sure. Right. What's going How on? How can Thanks. we help? I am currently on baby step number two. And at the beginning of the year, I started a YouTube channel, which has now opened an opportunity to make some additional income to go towards my baby step. My question is, on my YouTube channel, I try on and review clothing, which requires me to purchase quite a few pieces from each brand. I generally return most of the samples like once I'm done filming, um, but I'm currently funding this on a credit card that I only used for that. And I only pay the minimum balance, like the minimum due each month until I get the refund. At any given time, there could be up to 4000 on this card in rotation. 
is this an okay way to fund this and like chalk it up as a business expense or should I be approaching it in a different way? Um, yes. Yes, you should be approaching it in a different way. Having a credit card for business or personal is a bad plan because of the risk involved because it's a bad plan to cash flow your business. But I'll, credit card aside for a second, and I'll let Dave explain that even more, but you should not be paying for these clothes. These, ideally, these brands should be giving you free clothes to review for that the you exposure. Keep. That you keep for the exposure. You should not be pl- paying to give them business. This doesn't make sense. So your whole business model needs to be fixed from the inside out, aside from how you're, you're funding any expenses that you have, which should not be on a credit card. But I want you to go to these brands and get them to give you free clothes so, so for giving them exposure. How much are you making on YouTube? <laughs> So the actual YouTube portion of it, like I just hit the monetization and it's like very small. Eighteen dollars. About a yeah, like after a month of doing videos, this other platform reached out to me, and they pay me thirty dollars for each thirty second to two minute clip that talks about each product. What's your viewership? My viewership, I'm just over a thousand, so still pretty new. Mm -hmm. But I've made in like the past. Ooh, six or seven months with this other platform, I've made over twelve thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the risk that you're taking from a business perspective, screwing around with four thousand dollars in order to make eighteen dollars or thirty dollars or up to twelve thousand over many many months, uh, is inordinate. Uh, I'm not sure you got enough eyeballs yet on the thing to get them to give you the free clothes the way Christy's trying to talk about. But basically what you're doing is you're putting yourself in a position of being an influencer. And Mm -hmm. uh, the way influencers get paid is they monetize the eyeballs. They come to watch them do whatever it is they do. And so... um, that's what, you know, and obviously YouTube will pay you and other platforms will pay you as well if you can get the eyeballs. But a thousand is not, not a bunch. You're getting there, though. That's, I'm glad you're working this. Uh, so uh, what's your household income overall? So my normal nine to five, I make about 86000 Okay. I, I want you to set aside two grand for this business, maybe even out of the business income or three grand. And just prime the pump one time. By that, I mean open a separate checking account that is just for this clothing exchange process. Because if you get stuck, if one of these companies, let's say you bought a thousand bucks from somebody and they just said, oh, we're not taking that back. You wore it. Um, And so your little return refund program doesn't work anymore. You now ate that. And guess what? If it's on your credit card, you now have credit card debt. And so this is the risk that happens because there's one thing we're sure of in business. There's three things we're sure of in business. Um, It's going to cost twice as much as you think it's going to. It's going to take twice as long as you think it's going to. And you're not the exception. Those are the three rules of business. And it happens to me around here all the time. I have some great idea. I think this is going to work. And we put it out there and... Six years later into the Gold Planner, Christie's Gold Planner, which we launched today, is a mega successful product. The first year, yeah, wasn't sure it was that great idea. You know, a lot of dad <laughs> gum, well, weren't. a lot of dad gum work for not much money, you know? And so it's now it has fun. turned out to be a thing, but it took twice as long. It um, as yep. we thought, especially and initially. we're not the exception. Especially initially. And uh, no matter how enthused or en- enthusiastic or um, angry I am or Christy is, it doesn't <laughs> matter. You know, we still got to, you still got to, some things have to cook up. They're yeah. like good gumbo. Yeah. You know, and so, you, you, and in the meantime, you're carrying credit card debt. And I'm not going to ever advise that. You called the Dave, I mean, you called the Ramsey show. You called Dave Ramsey, Christy Rye asked us about a credit card. You knew, you, you <laughs> knew that wasn't going to work. I mean, that was, that, that is predictable. (laughs) We're consistent. (laughs) This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, it's Kelly, associate producer for The Ramsey Show. This episode is over, but if you heard about an event, product, or service and didn't have a chance to write it down, don't worry. We list everything you've heard about during this episode in the podcast show notes section or head to theramseyshow.com. Thanks for listening. This 
is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Christy Wright, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today, number one best-selling author and host of Business Boutique, a huge conference that we have coming up here in the fall, October 14th through the 16th, as a matter of fact. Dr. John Deloney, Jasmine Starr, Nona Jones, uh, Bianca Olthoff, Manit Shohan. Ah, Manit's coming. That's yes. cool. She's a uh, a celebrity on the uh, Chef ch- on the Food Channel, Food Network, and uh, also a local uh, entrepreneur. Owns a bunch of restaurants in our area, and just world class lady overall. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, that's a big addition. Yes. And uh, I'll be there speaking. And uh, it's going to be all about business boutique, all about uh, equipping women to make money doing what they love. And this conference has sold out every single year. It is October the 14th through the 16th. There are some tickets available for here in Nashville, and Nashville is a great place to visit. It is. It's a great uh, It's a great city to, to make a road trip out of it. If you've got some friends, you all have side businesses or small businesses you're working on, gather some friends, or even connect online on the Business Boutique Facebook group and, and sync up and share hotels and all that good stuff. And uh, It's a jam-packed three days, but it's also one of those that you come home so fired up and so filled up, and you know exactly what to do. You don't have to feel stuck you know what steps to take to grow your business where to get it to where you want to be yeah from where you are that's where you need to be that's right and that could be from the dream stage yeah or all the way from you've got a pretty sophisticated operation and you're just wanting to put some more tools in your belt and so um typically it's two thousand to three thousand ladies in this audience yep and um uh it it is um again we've just found that our hometown of nashville is very popular Mm -hmm. it's a very popular visit a place to come and hang out and uh but of course you know you need to book time around this to do all that because you're going to be in here busy yeah we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be, you know, you're going to go up to Water Fountain to get a drink. We're going to turn off. Our <laughs> it's been cool too, Dave, because I've noticed even recently in conversations as we've been talking about Business Boutique, uh, this event every year, we started it in 2015. Every year, this is the catalyst for so many women that changes the trajectory of their business, truly. I was just talking to someone the other day that has a massive worldwide business, okay, in 20 countries. They're absolutely rocking it. Multi-million dollar business started 2016 business boutique. Wow. And you hear these stories and you go, oh my gosh, that's the moment in time where something changed and they went home and did what they needed to do and this becomes the catalyst. So it's a great opportunity for people to get not only the information and steps which we give you, but get fired up uh, to believe in yourself and go home and do it. Yeah. Once you've been stretched, you never return to the same shape. Yeah. And this is a brain stretching conference your brain will never return to the same shit yeah <laughs> so business boutique uh christy me dr john deloney a host of other characters that are absolutely incredible communicators business teachers will be with you and october 14 through the 16 you need to get your tickets before they're gone again this thing is a sellout every year you text boutique to 33789. Check it out at ramseysolutions.com. But text boutique to 33789. The Business Boutique Conference coming up this fall. Caleb is with us. Caleb is in Los Angeles. Hi, Caleb. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Christine Dave. How y'all doing? Great. Great. What's going on? Well, um, uh, my question is, is about where I should put my cash now. So, heard about your plan for years and I finally just did it. My wife and three kids, we moved into my parents' barn on some acreage so we could finally, you know, pay off the debt. Um, we did, we were in a loft, you know, every dime that came in went to the debt, just gazelle intense. And then we had the whole ladder, you know, with the marker and then you mark it off, paint it off. And the very next morning we found out we were pregnant with twins. <laughs> so Congratulations. Oh, wow. I'm so glad you're ready. <laughs> it's, no, for real though. Like you're right. I mean, if I wouldn't have done that plan, you know, the stress of student loans, you know, I went to film school, you know, it's gone now. So here's, here's my issue. Um, I, I own my own business. Um, uh, I'm in film production 
Uh, so, you know, irregular income. Do you, I know the next baby step is pile, you know, three to six months living expenses, et cetera. But I have heard other people in the film industry call you before. And I remember you said something, something about, you know, get a much bigger buffer. What, what do you suggest for me right now? My twins are due end of November and we already have three kids under five. Yeah. So I'm looking for some advice. Well, while you are, you're in baby step three anyway, which 100% of your spare dollars are going to build your emergency fund, right? Okay. Uh, and so, mm-hmm. you know, three to six months of expenses. Now you can go ahead and build up, you know, six months of expenses and you can just keep building it past that until the twins come if you want. And then you'll just have some extra money. Beyond that, uh, aside from the twins, aside from the small kids, just the irregular volatile income with a small business mm-hmm. um, or in an industry like the film industry where it's um, feast and famine. I mean, you're either making yeah. bucks or you got nothing. And so exactly. uh, that, that we were in the real estate business when we came up with this idea because we had the same thing. We could have no money one month and 20000 bucks the next month. And so, um, right. and, and so what we did, uh, it's a dumb name, but I couldn't think of anything else. You think of a mountain and a valley. And the mountain is that big mm-hmm. month, that wonderful month. The valley is that horrible month, the valley of death, right, where you have no money. And so we called it a hill and valley account. So if we were in a valley month, we didn't have to hit the emergency fund. We had a separate savings account to fill in for a horrible month of income in a volatile income situation. And because that's not an emergency, that's actually a predictable event. Right, yeah. And do you have a percentage, Dave, that you recommend for that? No, I think what you look at is the volatility, and the volatility creates two things. One is actual arithmetic, and it also creates all this emotion. Yeah. You don't use the emotion to set the amount, because when you dig down into it, usually, you know, you, you feel like you have a $10,000 problem, and you might have a $2,000 problem. Yeah. And you go, look, that my worst month, here's my worst possible month, and here's what we need to exist. Well, you got to cover the difference. Right for two months right and you know it might be a thousand bucks off you know yeah so it might be two thousand dollars in your hill and valley account i wish i had a sophisticated i'm horrible at naming <laughs> stuff but that's all we called it because that's the only thing we could think to call it because we wanted to separate it from the emergency fund because the emergency fund is for unexpected events this is expected we know right. this is yeah. going to come yeah. and so i think you build up your emergency fund first and then you build your little hill and valley account just going forward, regardless of twins and babies. Do you have a question about that, Dave? Um, for businesses that are super seasonal like that, do you recommend they have a business version of the Hill and Valley? Or would you just use a retained earnings for retained that? Retained earnings you should be use that enough. For that. That's okay. the purpose of retained earnings. It's just to cover a, some seasonality. Yeah. And you can adjust your retained earnings based on you know your seasonality. Like for years around here uh, we our summers were slow mm-hmm. because live events are slow publishing's down in the yeah. summer uh, radio listenership is down in the summer typically and so our summers slow down now we've got a whole bunch of other product lines now that don't slow down so we don't notice it as much but we used to put some money aside to get ready for summer yeah you know financial peace university sales were down and you know july is way different than all october right you know that kind of thing so we just had to kind of get ready for that Stop paying your overpriced wireless provider and switch to Pure Talk. They use the same network as the larger providers for much less. For just $30 a month, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data with no contract. The average family saves over $70 a month by switching to Pure Talk. Just go to puretalk.com and enter the promo code RAMSEY to save 50% off your first month. Pure Talk, simply smarter wireless.
Chrissy Wright Ramsey personality is my co-host today. She and I will be doing an event Thursday, September the 16th, the Take Back Your Time event, uh, appropriately named with the launch of the book, Take Back Your Time, the Guilt-Free Guide to Life Balance, which comes out the week before. And uh, it's on pre-sale right now. And if you want to attend this live stream for Take Back Your Time, all about balance, all about getting control of your life, passes start at only $20. With your event pass, you get over $60 in free bonus gifts, including a copy of Take Back Your Time. You can join us in Nashville for the event and a special book signing with Christy or via the live stream, either one. You just got to tell us in advance which one you're doing because we will sell out here in Nashville, of course. Uh, You can feel balanced even in your busy life, and we want to teach you how. The Take Back Your Time live event and live stream Thursday, September the 16th. Text TIME to 33789. TIME to 33789. So when someone finishes watching that, what is it you want them to feel? relieved <laughs> okay. activated and relieved but here's the thing we feel so much pressure and guilt around our time that's why i love the tagline of the book the guilt-free guide to life balance this is not a productivity book it's not an event to show you how to do more faster multitask squeeze more in be more efficient i want you to feel free to do what's right for you right now i want you to feel free to spend your one life on what matters to you and we're going to show you how to do that in very tactical practical ways by the way Our question of the day comes from Blinds.com. Find out for yourself why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Free samples, free shipping, new promos all the time. It's a great American company. Use the promo code RAMSEY to get the best deal. Today's question comes from Diane in Ohio. I'm 61 and my husband is 58. We are doing well financially and have no debt. I'm currently a health coach for a health management company. I'm tired of playing the corporate game and tired of being micromanaged. I would really like to have my own practice coaching clients on healthy lifestyles, teaching cooking classes, and controlling my own schedule. I have no idea how to do this without leaving my current job and making no money at all for a while. What would my first steps be to start my own coaching business? Well, I'm going to start with the assumption that there's not a conflict of interest, non-compete, that type of thing. Because she wants to do what she's currently doing for this company, there's a little bit of, of gray area there to me in terms of what she's able to do. But I would say for Diane, uh, I want you to do this the same way I would teach anyone to start a new thing. That if you have a full-time thing, but you want to start something on the side, you start it on the side. And you start by putting it, putting uh, the information out there. Maybe it's a Facebook post. You email family and friends. Hey, I'm going to start doing this. You think about your pricing. Do a little research, a little digging of what would your packages look like? What would your services include? How are you going to structure uh, your services and, and your pricing and so on? And, and you start to baby step into it. And the reason we want to do that is because as you take those first baby steps, you're going to learn about what questions you need to ask, what answers and policies and uh, procedures you need to come up with. You're going to learn what your customers New deal fleshed out, get get some proof text, we call it, actually functioning in the marketplace, and then you'll have a lot more confidence about your move, and you don't have enough so many false starts that you give up. Yeah. 
because you don't have to give up. Yeah. And so uh, the good news is you'll develop a tolerance for the old place uh, once you re- once you have a plan to leave. Yes, that's a good point. It'll increase. It'll decrease your frustration with the old place because you're going. Yeah, just a matter of time. I'm out of here, so I can put up with you right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brian is with us. Brian is in Panama City. Hey, Brian, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you guys so much for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Um, okay, so I was I recently um, got married this past March. Congratulations. And thank you. And um, we were together. Uh, we we've been together for the past three years, developing. You know, just. Direct portal to hell. <laughs> you want to talk about disgruntled? It's just a, get Dave talking get, about technology. Get me talking about how much money uh-huh. I spend on technology, uh-huh. and then I can't even talk on the phone. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that just get me started. But yeah, so that's just life. And um, so, anyway, the I, I think it's good to go back to um, our, our, our lady we were talking about Diane, with the blinds.com blinds, yeah. question. Yeah. The um, it's always if there's any way you can mm-hmm. when you're starting something, start it on the side. And we always the the analogy I've always used, the metaphor I've always used is to bring the boat as close to the dock right. as you can before you step into it. That way you can step into it, not leap towards it, right? And hope you make it. When people always ask the question that way, they say, "How do I make the leap?" So yeah. full time. I, I, I work with women every day building side businesses, and that's the way they ask this question. How do I make the leap to full time? And, and, and Dave, you and I say this all the time. We don't want you to make leaps. We want you to take steps. When you do that, you will not fall as far. It will not hurt as much. We want steps, not leaps. So word is it. Brian's on the phone again. Hey, Brian, what's up? Are you there? Hey. Okay. Yeah. So you got okay, married so- in March, and what's going on? Okay. So... Um- my, okay, so my wife, uh, her parents, they're 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 very, they're very nice people. Um, they've done a lot for her growing up. Um, they're they're financially um, well off, and um, you know, since we uh, became married, I, I feel like it's our responsibility to, um, you know, kind of take, uh, I guess, a handle on some of the things like her retirement. Um, health insurance, life insurance, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, like grown-ups and stuff. Yeah, right. And so, so her dad still um, has all that in his possession? Yeah, her dad still has it in her, his possession. And they're kind of – every time we discuss, like, finances and money and things like that, it's, they get all weird. And Yeah, well, let me get weird for you, okay? Your, your wife needs to tell her dad to put the stuff into her name now. How old are y'all, Brian? Right. I I agree. I'm You 34. don't. You can't say it. Okay. All right. So that's where, yeah, I guess where I'm coming in here because, um, you know, I I would want to approach anything, whether, you know, I want it to be my place. And I think when it has to do, do with my wife, you know, we, we um, since we've become married, we uh, combined our life, got on the same page where we just became debt free. Yeah, but it's um, not your daddy. Take- it's her daddy. And it's right. not your policies. It's her policies right now. It's her retirement. Yeah. And she needs to move. It needs to be moved into her name now. And okay. she needs to call her dad and go, Dad, uh, I understand a few months after March, but now it's August. So I'm going to come over to the house and you're going to sign all the crap into my name now. Now, you can be a little nicer than that, but that's the message. <laughs> These nice people they definitely will that have nice a lot of money that. and mean well are control freaks, dude. And so, you know, your wife is needs to, it's called leaving and cleaving, but you can't do it. They're not going to listen to you.
Jesse Wright, Ramsey personality, my co-host today. The 2022 Gold Planner on sale this week at RamseySolutions.com. Very, very popular gold planning, life planning uh, item by Christy. This is the sixth or seventh year we've done these things, and they always sell out. And uh, so be sure and check out online at RamseySolutions.com. Dot com. Christy, I'm going to be Papa Dave for a minute. I want to go back to our last caller. Okay. Had a commercial bearing down on us. Yep. All right. I'm 61. I have three grown married children. All have kids. Not 61 yet. I'll be 61 in a couple of weeks, but close enough. Um, when your children get married, you do not have the moral, ethical right to hold on to their stuff, period. When they reach adulthood, you do not have the moral, ethical right to hold on to their stuff. And so example in our house would be uh, Denise comes home from college and she sets up her own household within three months. Uh, moves into an apartment with some roommates, uh, eventually starts dating a guy, gets married. Um, but when they're engaged, uh, I look down and realize there's a file here with mutual funds with her name on it. There's the health insurance is still running through us, which is stupid. This is like a grown woman. Right. And she needs to pay her own light bill. She needs to check the date on her milk carton by herself. Uh, and her mama don't need to do it. Yeah. And her dad doesn't need to hold her hand because he looks at her husband as a little boy. Yeah. Sorry, folk. You don't have that option. And when you do continue your helicopter parenting into their 20s, you damage the relationship with them potentially for the rest of your lives. And you stunt their emotional growth because they're still freaking little baby children. Because you didn't give them any grown-up stuff to do. Yeah. God, that pisses me off. Set them free. The Bible says to leave and cleave. So you leave your mama (laughs) and take your stuff with you. You know what I heard in that call, too, though? I wish so bad she had called because I heard in his voice he didn't want to talk to him. He wasn't supposed to anyway, but even if he was, he didn't want to. No, he was bowed up. He was ready to talk to him. Yeah, but it was like this nervousness. Like, you could hear something like, well, I don't know. He started out with, they were nice people, and I started laughing because I knew he was lying. We both, well, we both did because we were like, but. We were waiting for the but. Where's the but? Because the great canceler in a sentence. (laughs) Everything that comes before the word but means that those people or butts <laughs> so then but i wish we could have talked to her because i got the sense that she was not the type that wanted to talk to them no, didn't want no, to talk she, to she's them. been used to daddy taking care I of no and here's the thing so then speak Grow to that, up girl speak to that person speak to the the timid the child the adult child that's scared to talk to their parents give them some some help here it is your job as a 20 what was she he said he was 24 so yeah i think so yeah you know, she's 23 25 probably give or take i mean it, be a grown-up come on put your big girl pants on mm-hmm. and uh because the sooner you do that the 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 most one of the most rich times of our lives in our per- personal family is the current time where I have adult to adult relationships with my children, including my sons-in-law, and my daughter-in-law. Mm-hmm. And, um, I thoroughly enjoy them as adults, mm-hmm. but I, that means that I have to, I, you know, Rachel and I have, uh, I don't cross boundaries with her just like I don't with you mm-hmm. and you're, you know, you're, we're not kin. Right. We've been friends a long time. We've been on our team a long time. We've got a good relationship, but I, I, there's things I can't tell you to do. It's not my right yeah. and vice versa, by the way, you right. know? And so, right. you know, and, and the same thing's true with Rachel true. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I, we can, we can talk about stuff. We can argue about things. We can discuss politics. We can talk about life or religion or doctrine or whatever else, but that's just on a friend to friend level, so to speak. Yeah. And it's the most rich time. It's it, some of our Ramsey dinners, cause we're all loud and gregarious and fun <laughs> people are hilarious now, but it's like a group of, it's like a friend group having dinner. Right. Not, you know, 
dad is holding court and you all are going to now listen to me. Right. They quit doing that a while back, I'll just tell you. What do you think what do you think's going on in the dad in that scenario that wants to hold on to it? What, does he still see him as a as a kid? Yeah, he's, he, he's, he likes the power control. That's maybe who I'm both? talking to is him because I'm both? just he pisses me off. Mm. Because he's 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 being a twerp. Mm. He's trying to hold on to the past and you know, you walked her down the aisle, you placed her hand in his hand. Dude, you just gave her away. That's what they call that. All right. What if she's not married? Well she's twenty five though. Well, the same thing. Same. Except there's not a hand, there's not right, a right. leaving and cleaving. Well, I just want to clarify. Not yeah, a yeah. marital relationship, but they're still adults. And so you, what you're doing is you're tr- you're you're treating your twenty five year old like she's thirteen, and guess what? She's gonna function like she's thirteen, and then the rest of us in society have to put up <laughs> with this entitled little twit. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah. You have, you have people that are uh, uh, five years younger than you that you run into that are not functioning at that age. Yeah. Emotionally. Well, and it's a very, it's an unhealthy dynamic on both sides because you have the, uh, let's use the daughter in this scenario, it could be a son either way, but the adult child that will not stand up to mom or dad or speak up to mom or dad or say, I'm a grown up. These are my X, Y, Z funds, policies, whatever. And then you have the dad or the mom, whoever that is dominant, controlling. They like having the power. They like being the big, you know, big deal in the family. And so they, the, it's, it well, becomes this dynamic that's unhealthy in, on both sides. They both have a responsibility in it is what I'm saying. It is emotionally hard admittedly mm-hmm. to when your kids reach the point that you're no longer allowed to tell them what to do yeah i used to could just tell you to do stuff and you freaking had to do it <laughs> you know and now i can't do that now i have to convince you mm-hmm. or persuade you like i would one of my buddies mm-hmm. i've got to talk you into this is good for you here's why i think this and depending on how strong i feel about it you know yeah. but I may not even bring it up at all but th- this is just reasonable relationship boundaries and, and so, but, but it, some parents can, they have a real problem with this boundary uh, of, uh, and saying out loud, okay, this is like a grown butt human here. I can no longer tell them what to do. Yeah. Or I shouldn't be mm-hmm. telling them what to do. It shouldn't be effective. Someone should stop you from doing it, whether it's the person you're doing it to, your, yourself, your pastor ought to look at you and go, hello, you know, something, somebody ought to give you a little wake up call, you know, ring the bell for you and go, uh, you have now moved into a new phase. You no longer can boss them around. And uh, because the interfering mother-in-law, when the kid's 32 and she still rolls her eyes with the way the chicken pot pie is made, oh my God, that's a classic stereotype. Yeah. And it's like, you don't get to roll your eyes anymore. Yeah. You, you like have to be polite and stuff. Right. You know? Oh, my God. You wouldn't do that at your friend's house. Right. Or if you would, you wouldn't have any friends. Yeah. And yet you still think you can get away with it with those that you love the most and they're the closest to you. Yeah. And so, and it does go into the financial because the more, when you don't put the weight of the decision making on the grown child, they do not develop the strength to make the decisions. You have to let them feel the weight of that rent on their back. And I imagine the weight of the grocery shopping and you go, oh, my God, look what bread just did. Yeah. I imagine it has an effect on the marriage, too. For those that are married, then it's 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 stripping them of some of the dignity of figuring it out as a couple of communicating as a couple because mom and dad are still controlling everything, still having a say, still carrying the weight. It's like, no, like like as a as a couple, you have a fight and you run to your mom. yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. I told Rachel and Denise in particular, I said, when you have a fight and if you want to call over here and talk to us about it, you better bring them because otherwise I'm going to point you right back at him and go, <laughs> hey, I already told him you're now his problem. <laughs> you, you did say that. <laughs> I did exactly say you that. Did. You know I said that. I do. <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show. <laughs>
Christy Wright, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Tyler is in Colorado Springs. Hi, Tyler. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, how's it going today, Dave? Better than I deserve. What's up? <laughs> uh, I'm kind of in a funny transitional state in my life. I'm getting ready to transition out of the military, and I'm looking at living options once I get out. I'm going to go to college on the GI Bill. And I've been really struggling with whether or not I should rent or try to buy a home. But in doing some research, it doesn't seem like there's any way that I can get pre-approved for a home loan. And I understand that you hate VA loans. Can you can you clarify as to kind of why you you hate VA loans so much and also what your best advice is to me? Hate might be a strong term, <laughs> but um, but number one, the VA loans are more expensive with fees and interest rate than any of the big three, FHA, VA, or conventional. Number okay. two, VA loans. The reason most people gravitate towards a VA loan is you can get a, as you know, you can get a house with nothing down. Yeah, and that's, that's which means you're too dead gum to. broke to buy a house. Okay. When yeah, you buy a house with no money, a house is not a blessing. Okay. And and so because okay, so. because you know the air conditioner is going to go out next week. Okay. So I want so, you to have a house. I just don't want it to have you. So that that's the reason. I don't. I don't. I, it causes people to buy a home, in a when they're in a position of weakness rather than strength. So, what I would tell you to do is uh, rent the least expensive thing that you can, and let's work on your career and work on your goals and build up some money. Okay. So then, in that case, that leaves me with one of two options. I can either live with my parents for three hundred and fifty dollars a month, which Yes, that's awesome. But on How the long have you been hand, in the military? I've been in the military for nearly five years when I get out. That'd be, and that would be, back really, home, that'd be really painful. Yeah, and and my parents, I love them to death, great people, but it's, it's, it's difficult to live with them. And so my next option would be... Um, would be renting a apartment for about 850 bucks a month. Yeah, I try to get your roommate situation where you can get that cut down, but you don't need to be back at home. It's just okay. a, it's emotionally going to be destructive for everyone involved. Okay. And with that, though, I guess I have some extra money in the bank that I could use to float myself on the months that I don't get paid by the VA for the months that I don't go to school mm -hmm. or summer break or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but can, I, can you not I work? Really, I can work. Good. Uh, it's going to be very part-time. I do plan on getting a part-time job. I actually have a job lined up already. Uh, as soon as I get out. So what are you going to study, uh, and how long is it going to take you? Uh, I'm going for a construction management degree, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to take me four years. I'll get my bachelor's, and okay. I should graduate by, like, 2026, 20, somewhere okay. in there. All right. Well, I graduated in four years with a business degree from the University of Tennessee, and I worked 40 to 60 hours a week every week. Okay. So uh, very, very part-time is not necessary. You don't have to work that much because you're not starving to death. You've got the stipend and everything, but you also yeah. don't have to sit on your butt. And all okay. that extra money can go towards saving up for when yeah. you want to buy a house when you're ready to, Tyler. So the more you work, the more money you have, the quicker you get to that goal. And and if I were you, I would take it a step further and I would get a job in construction. Anything yeah. you can do around where you want to be meeting those people yep. that are doing what you want to do, what you're in school for, that's just going to fast track your whole plan. Yeah, get, a, get, get your uh, foot in the door and start learning some hands-on while you're learning in the classroom. And that's going to be, you're going to come out you know, with three major advantages towards your success, your military career, your hands on the job training and your academic background. You put those three things together, man, you got some really good taste in soup there. I, I think you got a bright future when you do all that. And the construction guys will appreciate you actually knowing what the flip's going on from something other than a textbook. All right. Cheyenne is with us in Bowling Green. Hi, Cheyenne. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Uh, yes. Um, just wanted to say I love you both. And um, me and my husband have actually been um, with the Ramsey Plus since October of 2020. Well, my husband has currently been working at his shop for six years. He currently works for a paint factory here in town. And they are a part of a union. And his union contract will be up May of 2022. Now, we have about 71,000. Well, we had 71,000 
thousand dollars in debt, and we currently have about twenty seven thousand dollars left. And we have about eight months from now. Um, he could potentially go on a strike if the contract does not. I thought you said May. Uh, yeah, May. Uh, is that months. not eight months? Oh, oh, okay. I thought it was. Is it? Is that yeah. eight months? It is, it is eight months. It is. Cheyenne, okay. don't you let him make you confused about your months. You okay. Got, like, no, you're right. Okay, okay. You got eight months. All right. So you could be debt free and still have a pile like, of money by then. Uh, I, well, that's what I was asking. Um, I was a little nervous because my husband's slow season is actually coming up this fall. Uh, typically, every single year he's been working there. The slow season starts in September, and um, in between September and potentially February, it's very slow. And the amount of hours and the amount of money that we're used to him getting most of the year is possibly going to dwindle down. And I'm a little bit scared to either go ahead and pay off the rest of the debt that we have or um, just pile up cash for a potential strike because I don't think that he would possibly get paid for the union strike. It used to be about $200 a week that he would what's get your, paid. Uh, what's your current household income? Um, 80000 Okay. Yeah, you can be debt-free and have the money by the time you need to. You only okay. have, have 27000 left. Yes. Yeah. And cur- currently, now uh, it, well, yeah. slow season means his hours go down to how many? Um, instead of him getting um about seventy hours a week, it'll probably bump down to forty, fifty hours a week, maybe. Wow! So he works seventy hours a week a lot of the year. Yes, and um, most of that is volunteer. Um, they've had a lot of people quit. Uh, you obviously know with the pandemic, a lot of people don't want to keep their jobs. That is definitely his case. Uh, when the whole pandemic started, they were actually the busiest they've ever been in their entire life. Mm-hmm. And so um, a lot of people have been quitting lately, and so that is keeping his overtime available. That's cool. But they've been so they've been slowly hiring people, and I'm just nervous because I'm yeah. a, I'm the person in the so family. So how many that times works. how many times has has his union gone on strike since he worked there? Um, since he worked there, it has not gone on strike. Which is how um, long? Near, uh, he's been working there for six years, and the last time, the longest it went, I think, was a month or a month and a half. You're, yeah, you're worrying about something you don't need to worry about. Okay. Okay. That's, you have that's a month and a half. Here. You have a month and a half problem, and you're going to be debt free. You're nervous about what ifs, and we don't plan based on what if scenarios. Cheyenne, yeah. you you got a plan to get debt free. You're going to get debt free. You're going to have some cash if this even happens, which it likely will not. Yeah, I want you to pile up a big old pile of cash and be debt free, and then you will actually be the most ready for a strike you've ever been since he's worked there. And it still probably and, won't. And happen. you're going to do all of that by May, but um, the likelihood of them going on strikes probably pretty low. Um, they're just rattling their sabers uh, and, um, you know, carrying on because to, to posture for the negotiations and so forth. Because what's happening is most factory situations are behind, and the last thing they want to do is get further behind. Uh, supply chain has been so screwed up by COVID, and the whole, you know, production means of production, manufacturing, everything has been so screwed up. The last thing they, they, unless the union is being completely outlandish, uh, the employer is going to sign up. <laughs> so they're not, they're in a position of weakness. It's a bad year for their contract to come up for that employer um, because they need to produ- produce. So I just, I, I, I think you're going to be okay. And I don't think you need to uh, worry quite at the level you're worrying being intentional and thoughtful about it yes i would do that and i think it's wise to you know look at the tea leaves see what's coming but i think you're overstating it yeah yeah you're going to pile up that cash shine and that's going to give you a peace of mind that you don't have right now when you have that you can see that you'll you'll even know even more that you're gonna be okay Christy Wright, good show. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Ramsey Personality, my co-host today. James Childs is our producer. Laura Johnson filling in for Kelly Daniel, who we can't seem to get to work these days. <laughs> She's going to kill you for that one. <laughs> <laughs> She's on strike. <laughs> this oh. is The Ramsey Show. <laughs> Have a
have a friend or family member that needs a daily dose of Ramsey advice in their life? Let them know about the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast. It's a quick hit of advice about life and money in under 10 minutes. Check out the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage is a big indicator you might be a Baby Steps millionaire. This is an everyday Baby Steps millionaire theme hour. We're talking to real millionaires this hour only. If you have a million dollar net worth or greater, I want to talk to you. I want to learn how you did that. Did you win the lottery? Did you inherit the money? Um, or did you work, save, and invest and live on less than you make? How did you do it? Because other people want to do what you did if they can do what you have done. A lot of the reason people don't strive to be financially successful is they believe that the system is rigged against them. And if you believe that it's rigged against you, then you never work towards winning. If you thought the game was rigged, why would you play the game? I, you know, I don't want to get you don't want to get in a card game where the, you know the outcome is already there because there's a shark at the table, right? You don't want to do that, and that that's logical. But what's not logical is the that you've believed lies from people who have political agendas, and or are just living in a victim mentality state and don't believe that they can win. And our goal around here is to give you hope. And people that steal your hope or ideas that steal your hope falsely, um, then, you know, I, I, it's my job, our job at Ramsey, to go to battle with those things. And so when people say, here's, here's what people say, stupid butt stuff, absolutely false, statistically proven to be false, Almost all of America's millionaires inherited their wealth. Absolutely a lie. We did the largest study of millionaires ever done in North America. Airtight research technique. No question. I defy you to find anything we did that was statistically incorrect or against basic research doctrine. There's processes you use to do airtight stuff so you don't fall into your own self. And, and prove what you think is going to prove. So here's what we found. We did we studied 10,167 millionaires, in-depth surveys with them, everything we could learn about them, so that we could show you whether you can do this or not. 79% of them inherited zero. That's 8 out of 10. Another 5% inherited money, but it was less than... $100,000, mathematically impossible for them to become millionaires because they inherited money. I got $5,000 when my granny died from the sale of her farm. That did not make me wealthy. Okay? So another 5%. So that puts us at 84%. Another 5% inherited substantial money from a family member after they were already millionaires. So they already got a million five net worth. Granny dies, leaves them 250000 but they did not become millionaires because of inherited money. Period. And so this great socialistic lie by the entitled socialist community is, is it's, it's stealing people's hope. So we started doing this show. Why so often we do a millionaire theme hour. We're going to take calls from those of you that are millionaires. Oh, by the way, that was another 5%. So 5 and 5 and 79 is 89. Nine out of 10 millionaires in America today did not become millionaires because of inherited money. So the great question is, what did they do? That's what we want to answer this hour. And then you can decide if you can do that too. My contention is you can do it. And I can show you how. So, an everyday Baby Steps Millionaire Theme Hour. Regular people, just like you, just like me, 
becoming millionaires. We want to talk to them. If you have a net worth of a million dollars or greater, you call me. I want to hear how you did it. Tim is our first one. He's in Des Moines, Iowa. Tim, what is your net worth? Uh, net worth is about $2.4 million. Excellent. Give me a little breakdown on that between what types of and where is that money located and what categories? Oh, let's see. We're in real estate, um, cash, and small mutual funds. And okay, some, real, uh, estate, real estate is how yeah. much? Uh, we're pushing 1.6. Okay, a lot of real estate. Good. Okay, how yeah. much in mutual funds? Um, I'd say about... Um, most of the rest of that, there's a little bit of cash in there too. Okay, so that so like is that retirement accounts then? Yes. So about eight hundred k in retirement accounts. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. How old are you? Uh, we're forty three. All right. How much of this did you inherit? Uh, well, I like to consider the fact that we invested it from the BST program. It's a I call it the blood, sweat, and tears program. <laughs> So none. Zero. We didn't, okay. we didn't inherit right. any of it. No. So uh, what was your best year working lifetime income, household income, and your worst year lifetime? Uh, uh, I'd say best year was 240. Um, worst year was 16,000. Okay. What do you do for a living? Uh, I'm a building consultant, uh, insurance consultant, claims consultant. Okay. What's your degree in? I uh, do not have a degree. No, no, don't have a four-year degree. Okay. What no, was your GPA in high school? Uh, high school? Mm-hmm. Uh, enough to get a diploma. Okay. <laughs> you graduated like I did. Thank you, Lordy. Yes, okay. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, you're a real estate guy. How much of this wealth do you feel like you have uh, because you borrowed money to become wealthy? Um, I'd say zero. Okay, so how did you do the real estate if you weren't mm-hmm. borrowing money to do it? Because uh, we cash flowed, um, and we just flipped houses. With, um, you we, took your profits and rolled them back in? Yes, sir. And so the you, you never really had a whole bunch of mortgage debt. You didn't do like the uh, uh, nothing down real estate club? No, no, okay. no, absolutely not. Right, just trying to make sure people hear what really <laughs> is going on. How, and, and so you're 43 years old. What's your advice to the 23-year-old version of you that's out there listening? Can he still do it, and what should he do? Um, yeah, he can do it. Um, he should have done it 20 years ago um, because it is possible. We we became debt-free 2018. Um, we did the debt-free scream there at the show with the family. Um, it doesn't matter how many kids you have. We have 11 kids. Whoa! And, yeah. Um, and Tara's pregnant with the 12th. We're expecting in December. Um, and, uh, uh, if you want to accomplish it, you can. And if you hear all of the different advices out there, financial advice out there, there's a lot of different advice. There's a lot of different good advice out there, but once you actually follow the baby steps and you actually apply it, and you get your brain straight around and get your head wrapped around what this actually means and what you can accomplish, then I believe anyone can accomplish this. Anyone so, can be debt-free. Not anyone to put words in your mouth, but I want to make sure I understand. You, you consider yourself a Baby Steps millionaire. You did it doing the Baby Steps. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Hey, man, thanks for calling in, and congratulations on number 12. Whoa! <laughs> Wow, you got to be a millionaire just to feed them, (laughs) just to buy the bus. Wow, good for you, man. It's wonderful. Large families are awesome. This is The Ramsey Show. is full of firsts. As the first and longest serving Christian health cost sharing ministry, CHM has shared medical expenses for its members since 1981. We believe you should have the freedom to focus on your health while being supported by a community of believers, giving you the opportunity to create many more firsts.
If you're struggling with money, it's easy to tell yourself that you'll deal with it later. I'll start fresh next year, but then later rolls around, you're still out of control. You have to decide. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I've had it. This is the last month I'm going to do this. When you decide that, we're ready to help. This month, we're knocking $30 off a 12-month membership to our most impactful, life-changing class and money products and tools. It's all included in a Ramsey Plus membership. When you do Ramsey Plus, you get access to Financial Peace University, which millions of people have gone through this class learning how to not only get out of debt, but to become Baby Steps millionaires, like we're talking about this hour. You get the premium version of our budgeting tool, Every Dollar, and you deserve a life uh, free of monthly payments and constant money stress. Start your free trial of Ramsey Plus today by texting TRIAL to 33789. Text TRIAL for a free trial to Ramsey Plus to 33789. It is a millionaire theme hour. We are talking to people with a $1 million net worth or greater. A net worth is calculated what you own minus what you owe your assets minus your liabilities it's not a feeling it's not an income well a million dollars isn't enough it's not a point all people who have a million dollars are evil this is not a moral construct it's an arithmetic formula that's the deal do you simply have what you own minus what you owe equals one million dollars or greater if so you're a millionaire and i want to talk to you Maybe it's worth $10 million. I don't care. But I want to talk to you because you actually have done it, and people out there need to hear what real people sound like, not people on talking heads on stupid butt news channels. They need to talk to real human beings, and you're who it is. So if you have a million-dollar net worth or greater, call me right now. The phone number is 888-825-5225. Greg is in Des Moines, Iowa. Hi, Greg. Welcome to The Ramsey Show. Thanks for taking my call, Dave. Sure. What's up? I was uh, letting you know I was a, I'm a millionaire. Good for you. How much? So, well, what is you. your net worth? One million. One million dollars. Perfect. Yes, sir. And uh, give me a little breakdown on that between the different classes. What's? How much is in retirement, mutual funds? How much is in real estate? So on. Roughly four fifty in retirement. Mm hmm. Four fifty in uh, real estate, including a few rental houses, mm -hmm. and about a hundred cash. Okay. Good for you. How old are you? 38. How much of this $1 million did you inherit at 38 years old? You know, we got a few bucks when my mom died, but that uh, blew it. Uh, I think it was uh, a couple thousand dollars is all. Oh, okay. And it wasn't, it had nothing to do with, with any of this. Okay. So you're not a millionaire because of an inheritance. That's the point. Okay. So, uh, very cool. What do you do for a living? I teach. You're a teacher. What do you teach? I am. Um, healthcare. You teach healthcare. Yeah. In what what in what setting? Community college setting. Okay, good for you. All right. Thank you. So, what your best year of household income and your worst year of household income? Combined, probably two hundred best, and worst is probably thirty thousand coming out of college. Okay. What's your wife do for a living? She also teaches healthcare. Okay. Ah, very interesting. All right, cool. You know, the number three uh, uh, profession that we found was teacher as we in our millionaire study uh, doctors didn't make the top five From you. That is envy. Are you with me? 
Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so they got the phones going. So I, I was filling till we could get back to you. So okay, I'm guessing your degree is in healthcare. It is. Okay, and what was your GPA? Uh, three seven five, I think, for uh, my master's degree. Oh wow, good for you. Okay, cool. So, what's your advice to someone who wants to have a million dollars by the time they're thirty-eight? Congratulations, hero. Well, thank you. Uh, two things come to mind: is one is, of course, invest early, and the other is more important: is simply be intentional with your time, your resources, your finances. Are you back with me again? Coming in and out. I am. Okay. Sorry about that, Greg. I apologize. Apparently, we've not spent enough on our technology here. Um, we got a deal on it, though. I'll just tell you. Um, the there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, like your, what's your advice to the younger version of you? You did this very early. Start early and be intentional. You know, oh. do things on purpose. That's, that's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah, and just and do you feel like you guys uh, didn't have any life that you just stayed at home and clipped coupons and never came out except on triple coupon Thursday or whatever? No, ten years ago we, we went to Spain. We spent three weeks in Barcelona and had a great time. We we had done everything we wanted to do. Okay, you've just been very careful, very intentional. Uh, it, it's not like you're like super frugal, dumpster diving or something for your food or something. You just made money, and you've made good money. I mean, your best year is 200000 between the two of you, and uh, and you turn around and use that to build wealth. Okay, back to our construct because I'm jumping around all over the place here. But here's the thing. I have met tens of thousands of millionaires in my life because of what I do. Several years ago, once I became a millionaire, I thought, well, I need to meet some billionaire, billionaires, because I don't have a billion, and so I need to talk to people about how to do that. And I've now met, I think, 40 or 50 billionaires in my life. Um, I will tell you that out of those billionaires, and there's some strange cookies that are billionaires, okay? That's a different, that's a different, that's a thousand million, okay? So this is a millionaire times a thousand is a billionaire. And so it's a different world than, than, you know, somebody with $10 million net worth, they're not even close to billion. It's a different world, different mindset, different everything. But even among those uber rich, which are definitely probably not one percenters, they're probably one half of one percenters. Out of all of those that I met, I think 50 or 60 of them, I lost count somewhere around there of how many I've met and had conversation with, not just drove by and said hi, not just got a picture with, but actually had a five or 10 minute or more conversation with, developed a plan, whatever, that kind of a thing. Out of those people, two of them are absolute tools, horrible people that I really, you have to take a shower after you meet them. But two out of any 60 people you meet, whether they have money or not, qualify for that. So it's not really any different. So this idea that the only way to become wealthy is to be a crook or rip people off is ludicrous. Because by and large, the way people build wealth is they bring value to the marketplace. They're serving someone. They don't, they don't just wait tables. They have a restaurant. Oh, wait, they don't have one restaurant. They have 10. 10 restaurants doing a good job taking care of people feeding them, collecting money for feeding them, and they build a, a little miniature restaurant empire, you know? And, and so that's what's going on. So the idea that they inherit their wealth, that that's where money comes from? Nope. The idea that you have to be crooked to be wealthy? Nope. This is all small-time thinking by small-time people that are jealous and envious. They're victims. You're not a victim. This is The Ramsey Show.
an everyday Baby Steps Millionaire theme hour. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. We're talking to real millionaires this hour. People have a net worth of a million dollars or greater. Your net worth is what you own minus what you owe. And that determines whether or not you're a millionaire. You may not have a goal to be a millionaire, but you are listening to a money show. And the reason for getting out of debt is not just to feel better. The reason for getting out of debt is to be able to increase your generosity, increase your net worth, increase the stability in your life, um, retire with your golden years, take care of your kids' college, all these kinds of things. It's not money that matters. It's what money does that matters. The money is useless. I mean, eat enough lobster, it tastes like soap. I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do with money, but what it, what you use it for is why people choose to acquire money. Now, how do you get to a million dollars? The fastest way I know is following the baby steps, um, and it is the most sure probability. Let's talk to some real millionaires. Amy is in Dallas. Hi, Amy. How are you? I'm great, Mr. Ramsey. How are you? Better than I deserve. What is your net worth? <laughs> uh, one point eight million. Okay, cool. Break that down for me by category a little bit. Um, I'd say um, seven hundred fifty k is about you know four hundred one k's Roth IRAs. Mm-hmm. Um, seven hundred k is in stock, other stocks and mutual funds, um, house, and then um, cash as well. Okay, that's uh, so you got about two hundred and fifty in cash. Uh, so uh, stocks is about 700k, and then house is about 400k, and then plus other cash, and then plus the 750 from the 401ks and Roth IRA. Gotcha. How old are you? Um, I'm 32, and my husband's 31. Wow, you did this really fast. Congratulations. How much of this 1.8 million did you inherit? Uh, none on my side. I think my husband got like 15,000 before we got married, but obviously that's not indicative of why we have what we have right for sure okay what's your best year of working household income and your worst year of working household income so we got married about three years out of college so our best together was about 120k or sorry worst together is about 120k our best um was probably last year at about 320k but that's we got a couple big bonuses that's not the average (laughs) okay cool what do y'all do for a living uh (laughs) Surprise, surprise, we're both engineers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you fit the model. Oh, my gosh. And obviously, you have so, engineering degrees. What were your GPAs? We do. Uh, mine was 3.3. My husband's was 3.1. But uh, that doesn't, that's not indicative that I'm smarter than him, though. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm going with that. I'm going with that narrative. <laughs> I'm just saying. All right. So this is an impressive number in a very short period of time. By 32 and 31 years old, 1.8 million, as engineers making <laughs> as engineers making a high of 320 household income. So you, on that high year, you had an unbelievably fabulous income, but you guys have killed it. What was your secret? Um, I mean, if I could be honest, I would say it's it's four things. One, I'm going to give my parents a shout out. It's listen to them. They've been around the block. <laughs> um, so my dad, you know. He sat me down as soon as I got out of college and said, hey, don't get enticed by the shiny object. You're going to be making a lot more than you made previously. Set a budget and live by it. And I did. And then number two, uh, treat it as not your money, but it's a gift from God that you're just stewards of. You know, so it's never yours. It's his. And he's trusting you to be a good steward for it. And then three, same page as your spouse. You know, my husband and I have never had a disagreement about money ever. And, uh, you know, before we got married, we went to this, you know, premarital counseling with our pastor. And he joked that we were 99 percent compatible on financial principles, which like, okay, great, because that's the number one cause of divorce. So we're good there. (laughs) And then um, it's the fourth one is live below your means. We've never lived on any more than 60 percent of our income and we've never changed our lifestyle. So. And by the way, 60% of your income is pretty dadgum sweet. (laughs) Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, Um, it's not like, it's not like you're, you're, you're living, you know, in somebody's basement or something. I mean, you guys are killing it. This is so well done. I'm so proud of y'all. This is excellent. Uh, (laughs) Absolute heroes. Okay. So you just gave us the formula, live on less than you make, uh, be on the same page with your spouse 
keep the nobility factor going, knowing that you're a steward, you're just an, uh, you're not an owner, you're a manager for God, a and mm -hmm. uh, just use some common sense and, you know, you don't be a bass, because bass get caught by shiny objects. Yeah, I mean, we've never changed our lifestyle. I mean, I think, I, I, I remember you guys asking, what's your most expensive pair of jeans? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you've asked that before. Yeah. Man, I think mine's like 30 bucks, and it's not even the amount of money I spend on jeans, but I think it's the amount of money we spend on clothes per year. I think our budget for the year is $150 on clothes per year. So, so you're, not, you're, not clo you're not clothing motivated. <laughs> what are you motivated by? What is, what is your thing? What is your, what is your guilty pleasure you do spend money on? If I could, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. How, I guess it's kind of weird. I don't even know how to answer that because I think my guilty pleasure is giving to others. Like mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, like if a family member calls me and says, Hey, Amy, I need your help with this in a heartbeat. Yeah. You know? It, so, and I love doing that. And I think my husband teases me all the time because I won't get expensive things for myself, which he loves because then he starts, you know, hey, anniversary, I'll get her this. Christmas, I'll get her this. <laughs> yeah. I won't, I won't get it for myself. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that's – that's. Well, I mean, you okay, guys Dave, are... I'll, I'll give you one thing. We splurged on a vehicle. Okay. But it was the best thing ever when we could uh, pay cash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I so what, what, is, what, is the, what's, what, what was the splurge vehicle? What was it? It was a, a Yukon XL recently. Okay, recently. And you've got a $1.8 million net worth. Yes. You, uh, you're not broke with six student loans and four car payments and a MasterCard hanging around your neck, and then you go get a new Yukon and go, I deserve it. You didn't do that. You got a, First, you went and got a $1.8 million net worth by the time you're 32. You guys are amazing. I'm honored to talk to you. Very cool. Carol, how are you? What's your net worth? I'm um, good, Dave. Great speaking to you. My net worth is $2.2 million. Good for you. Give me a little breakdown on that by category. Uh, 245000 in real estate, 100000 in cash, and the rest is 401k and IRA. Wow. Big 401k. Okay. Killing it. Great how old are you? Up. I am 61. Okay, cool. And how much of the 2.2 did you inherit? Zero. Zero. Okay. A lot of hard work. Okay. Are you married or single? I am single divorced. Okay. And uh, how, long ago, how long ago were you divorced? Four years ago, and I was told I'd be bankrupt in a year, but instead of being bankrupt, my portfolio has grown. So, yes. <laughs> you don't look bankrupt to me. No, I'm not. Yeah. And that money, that 2.2 that, um, does not even include my daughter's 529 plan, which is about 100000 Wow. Way to go. So what is... Uh, been your average income over the years? Um, when I first started out contributing to my 401k, it was about 45000 and now I'm up to about one hundred and thirty. What do you do? I am a risk analyst. A risk analyst. Okay. Risk that analyst, makes sense. Right. <laughs> All right. And uh, what's your degree in? I have an associate's degree in business administration. Wow. And what was your uh, GPA during that time? Well, let me see. It was a while ago, but I was about 3.9. Okay. I went as an adult, so I was yeah. a little more focused than as a teenager. So. Gotcha. Okay. What's your advice to the younger version of you that's listening to be able to have 2.2 million at 61, four years after a divorce? I would say slow and steady. Absolutely. Um, take advantage of every program your employer has to offer. If they have a 6% match in the 401k, you put your 6% in. And live below your means. I know I hear that a lot on your show, and absolutely, we live below our means. So. Well done, Carol. Proud of you. Excellent job. Oh, by the way, we usually don't talk to people that are savants either. The average GPA is around 3 Mine was 2.97, and I'm still pissed off about that three one hundredths of a point.
John 1, 5 is our scripture of the day. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Abraham Lincoln said, character is like a tree and a reputation like its shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. It's a millionaire theme hour as we talk to real millionaires, people who really have a million dollars or more. Not your broke brother-in-law with an opinion. Not your little socialist left-wing college professor, but people who really have a million dollars. How did they really get it? John is in Virginia Beach. John, what's your net worth? Hi, Mr. Ramsey. It's an honor to speak to you. It's uh, $2.15 million. $2.15. Good job. Give me a little breakdown on that by category. Uh, IRAs from various rollovers are at uh, 1229000 and uh, both the wife and I have two Roths at 155000 and then we have a joint like electronic fund in there at uh, 57000 Mm-hmm. And then we have a home that's got about 134000 left on it, but valued at 620000 so... Half a million there. You count it... Yeah, we count that as four eighty six, and then with our current jobs, we got about one hundred and two, one hundred and thirty two thousand in uh, company four hundred one k's. Wow. Okay. Cool. How old are you? And an emergency fund. I'm going to be fifty seven in November, and the wife turned sixty two this year. Okay. Great. How much of the two point one five did you inherit? Oh, nothing. Okay. And um, they always sound surprised, like. Um, Nothing, of course. I mean, it's like, okay. No, so, nothing. <laughs> so, what's your uh, best, uh, your best working year uh, household income, and your worst working year household income? All right. Well, so in the eighties, we were married in eighty six. So, combined together, I would say we were maybe at fifty thousand a year, uh-huh. and. Peak earnings were early 2000, say 2005, 2006, before she semi-retired, and we were probably at 170000 Okay, cool. What do, you, what do you do for a living? I'm a SACOM engineer. Okay. Okay. So, cool. Work with the military. Gotcha. And what about your wife? What did she do? She is semi-retired, but she worked her way up from a part-time cashier job to being a district manager for a major, major fast food company. Okay. All right. Very cool. Yeah. What's your degree in? (laughs) We're dinosaurs, Dave. My wife had one semester, and that's it, with a college um, diploma. And I had a – or not a college diploma, high school diploma. I had a high school diploma. And uh, I did a bunch of different, uh, you know, techie courses because I grew up with the technology, yeah. not like the kids. You know, I had to grow into it. So um, I may have enough matriculated credits for an associate, but I have. They told me to graduate at age forty that I would need, uh, I don't know, math, English, and philosophy. And basically, at that time, I was already making good money, and I said, "Screw it." So. It was against your philosophy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I love it. So, what's your I advice mean, to the uh, what's your advice to the twenty four year old version of you that's listening out there? Do you think they can still do it today? And if they can, what should they do? Oh, absolutely, definitely start in your twenties. We got started late. Hmm. You know, we were on credit go, uh, credit card merry go round for years until we finally got tired of it. But uh, yeah, start early, invest early, and. You know, live below your means and pay for everything in cash, save up and pay for cash, except for, you know, obviously the house is a big ticket item. But, I mean, it can be done. Yeah. So you didn't take any huge risks. You just got out of debt, lived on a budget and invested. Oh, absolutely. Yes, we have. We've had an investor for the last decade now that helps us, a fiduciary investment firm. Gotcha. So, Very cool. Yeah. Well, hey, man, way to go, John. We appreciate you sharing with us. Congratulations, you did it. So the 10,167 millionaires that we studied, here's what we found. I've already told you, 89% of them did not become millionaires because of inheritance. 79%, that's 8 out of 10, 
By the way, when you're doing statistics and you have something that's 79 percent, that is a significant freaking number that that establishes like a principle. It's not just like, oh, 52.4 percent. And we're not sure we've got all the votes we need to actually make him president. You know, I mean, it's not that this is not this is not hairline stuff here. Seventy nine percent is like everyone. OK, when you hear a number like that in a piece of research, it's it's statistically devastating. Seventy nine percent of a mil- of millionaires did not attend prestigious private schools. Turns out where you go to school don't matter. Help you with that, except for the grammar when you're doing talk radio, but (laughs) which it turns out you can have bad grammar and still succeed. 62% graduated from public state schools, 8% attended community college, 9% are high school graduates like our last caller. 68% of millionaires, that's statistically significant. Use a financial advisor to help them on their journey. 73% of millionaires never had a penny of credit card debt. Seven out of 10 never had student loans. By the way, half the population has had a student loan. But seven out of 10 millionaires didn't. Top three jobs, I already told you, engineer, accountant, and teacher. 96% enjoyed what they did for a career. I hate my job is not something millionaires say very often. I hate the place I work is not something millionaires say very often. If they feel that way, they leave. That's kind of like integrity and stuff. One third of millionaires never had a six figure household income. Not even one year. 33% became millionaires without ever making a $100,000 household income. That one kind of blows my mind. I mean, you it does help to earn more money. No kidding, you know? Wow. The average millionaire lives in a 2,600-square-foot house that they have lived in for 17 years. The average millionaire paid off their home in 11 years. The average millionaire in the Ramsey tribe that we did some separate research on pays off their home in a little under 10 years. 94% say they live on less than they make. 93% use coupons. Most of them hit millionaire status right around age 49. 97% of millionaires believe they control their own destiny. 62% of the public believes that. Belief matters. That's why we do this show. 70% say they set some other income aside for generosity every single month. So, turns out there's a formula to building wealth that is highly predictable. Invest in your 401k steadily, like baby step four, 15% of your income going into retirement, after you've gotten out of debt and have an emergency fund in place, and then work to pay your house off. If you pay your house off in 10 years or less, you're putting 15% of your income away into retirement and you make an average household income and you start that process at 40 years old, you will retire with more than a million dollars, probably more than five million, depending on your household income. It just works. These baby steps that we teach, it is the shortest path. It is just simply works. But everybody's got to mess with it. Everybody's got a gripe. Everybody's got a whine. Everybody's got an opinion. And, and so we do these shows to go, guys, these are real people that do this. Why we call them Baby Steps Millionaires? It's because they really freaking did this. Does anybody do it perfect? Do most of us have regrets? No one does it perfect, and all of us have regrets. We all could go back and go, well, if I'd started then, think about how much I If I hadn't done that stupid butt thing, how much I would have had. We all have that. But the point is, this formula is a predictable outcome. It is arithmetic. It's not happenstance. It's not by people like you. You are people like this once you decide to be. That puts this hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, hey guys, Christ Jesus. Hey, guys, senior producer for the Ramsey Show. Did you know over 18 million people listen to the Ramsey Show every week? 
And a lot of those people listen on one of our 600 plus radio stations across the country. To find a station near you, head to theramseyshow.com. 